is I'm just starting today with a question. It's not a trick question. It's not a difficult question, but it may make you scratch your head a little bit. We will be in Matthew chapter 12. For now, let me ask, what do you get when you squeeze a lemon? <laughs> yeah, exactly. More specifically, what do you get when you squeeze a lemon? A wet hand. <laughs> that too, yeah. <clears throat> what do you get when you squeeze a lemon? The most simple and basic explanation and answer is whatever's on the inside. You get lemon, don't you? You may get lemonade, but you're also going to get some seeds. You're also going to... Lemonade takes work afterwards, but originally the squeezing just releases whatever was on the inside. What do you get when you squeeze a lemon? You get whatever is on the inside. You get a lemon. Now, I've heard this a few times throughout this, and, you know, we've all seen people acting weird and acting strange and acting abnormal during this corona thing, right? It's been said, you know, the, the people caught the corona crazies or people are secluded and isolated. They're, they're, they're acting differently. And it's all as a result of the corona, the lockdown, the, the shutdown, the, the, the straying from their original live or whatever, right? There's pressure, stress, and influence of others for the last little while and is that what is causing men to act, talk, and behave the way they are? Or are men simply being themselves and it's only the situation that releases it? Right. People always say, oh, the devil made me do it. Oh, you made me mad and that's why I blew up. Oh, this, this happened and then that's why I behaved that way. But one of the most simple laws of nature is if you squeeze a lemon, you get what's on the inside. And I believe the scriptures teaches that. No such thing as people being influenced by what's gone on, and that's the reason why they're acting this way. I, I was fine, and then my husband did this, and therefore I. I was fine, and then my wife did that, and therefore I. I was fine... And then Corona happened, and now I'm acting crazy. No, 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 no. You were crazy. You are crazy. It's just the situation of Corona now let us all see that. There was a squeeze. There was stress. And all we're seeing now in people is whatever was on the inside. In Matthew chapter 12, the Bible starts to highlight that. Matthew chapter 12, and in verse 31. Matthew 12, verse 31 says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. And that's a universal truth in the scriptures. The tree is known by his fruit. And I would take it a step further and just say the fruit is known by its flesh. The fruit is known by what's inside of it, right? You can carry it up. This is a lemon tree. Woo, that's sour. How do I know that that was a lemon? Because the taste of the lemon. Well, how do I know that that came from that tree? Well, because it's a lemon tree. And you can, you can, you can basically work it back. The tree is known by its fruit. That fruit is known by the flesh or what is on the inside of that fruit. Verse 34 continues and says, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What's in abundance in your heart is always going to be what comes out when there is pressure, when there is stress, when there is influence from the outside. It's like carrying a topped up cup. You fill your mug to the brim. It's abundantly full. Now, as you're walking with it, if something bumps into you, if you slip on something, if someone startles you and that spills, it wasn't the event that caused what was in it to be present. It's not like the cup was completely empty and then you scared me and it filled up with grape juice and now it's on the floor. This is your fault. No, 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 no. 
What was in the heart? What was in the cup? What was there was always there. All that happened was the event caused it to come out. That bump, that startle. The event can't be accused of causing the contents to just suddenly appear. No, the event simply caused that what was always there came out. And it was a mess. And it was a disaster. And it always is. When our flesh, what's abundantly in our heart, which we're trying to push down, press down, hide from everybody, comes out, it's always a mess. It's always a disaster. But whatever was there in your heart was there already. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And the mouth is simply just telling you what is in the heart. It's telling everybody what is in your heart. It's true that we need to be mindful of our words. Continue on in verse 35. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. It says here that our words define us, and our words defile us. Where's that? Verse 37. For by thy words thou shalt be justified. They will define you. Your words shall justify you and define you. And by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Your words will also defile you. Whatever sort it is. That's what our words do. But both cases, whether it's your words justifying yourself before men, or whether it's your words defiling you before men, in both cases, all your words are is a simple reflection of what's on your insides. It's simply whatever was abundantly inside you bubbling out, spilling out. You're like that lemon. Everything was good and contained until somebody put the squeeze on it. And then it just couldn't help but spill out. What spilled out? Whatever was on the inside. If you're full of unrighteousness, unrighteousness is going to spill out of your mouth. If you're full of righteousness and godliness, when the squeeze is on, what comes out is righteousness and godliness. You can see where I'm going with this. What do you get when you squeeze a lemon? What do you get when you squeeze a Christian, right? Whatever's on the inside. Our words define us, and our words, as we've seen before, our words can also defile us. Go to Matthew chapter 15, just a few pages to the right. Matthew chapter 15. While you find Matthew 15, I'll begin reading in verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus ye have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. And here's the rub. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You see the hypocrisy? How they can have a heart that's far from God, and yet they're trying to muster up what's abundantly supposed to be in their heart. What are they doing? They're revealing themselves as hypocrites. Verse 9 says, In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Their heart is full of the wrong things, and nevertheless their mouth is saying the right things. But we know that our words very clearly justify us or condemn us. So what's happening here? It's hypocrisy. They're saying something but doing other. And do you know what happened to these religious hypocrites? When you put the squeeze on them, no matter how much honor with their lips and drawing nigh unto Christ they try to do with their lips, when they're squeezed, their heart's going to be exposed. This is always the case. You can always know a tree by its fruit. You can always know the fruit by its flesh, whatever's on the inside. We continue on in verse 10. It says, And he called the multitude and said unto them, and this is part of the same teaching now, 
Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. So the Pharisees are all worried about his disciples not washing their hands. And if you're a man and you're at the job site, even in the time of Corona, when it's lunchtime, hey, you got to eat. Sometimes the best you can do is go like this and get that sandwich in your mouth, right? Just dust it off, right? <clears throat> These disciples were working men. And they were in the same frame. They were the same fashion. They just, when it was time to eat, they didn't have time to wash. But the Pharisees looked at this as a great hard thing. They weren't, I believe, working men. They were just religious men, okay, let's say. They said, you're breaking the tradition of the elders by doing this. And Jesus Christ said, you're breaking no laws, and why are you condemning them? You're teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Christ exposed them as that. And then he turns and addresses the people and gives them the spiritual truth that they are missing. It's not what you put into your mouth that defiles you, right? But what comes out of your mouth? So a lot of people will have these really clean diets. They'll be a vegan. They're only going to eat non-GMO. They're going to do all these things. Okay, that's good and well. But what goes into you isn't what defiles you. If someone wants to have a Big Mac and someone wants to have leasy non-GMO salad, okay, they're none of them more defiled as the other. Okay, obviously one's a wiser choice, of course, given that we want to be good to our bodies and our temples, right? But Jesus here is very plainly teaching. It's not what you eat. It's what comes out of your mouth that's going to defile you. Verse 12, Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? And Jesus trimmed the message, right? He changed it. He edited it. He, no. They're offended. And what's Jesus' response? He answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both of them shall fall into a ditch. Jesus Christ says, leave them alone. Blind leaders of the blind, let them be offended, he says. Now we'll continue on in verse 15. Then answered Peter and said unto him, declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. Whatever you eat, it's not going to defile you, but what comes out of your mouth, that certainly will defile you. By your words thou shalt be justified. By thy words thou shalt be condemned, Jesus Christ is saying. And he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If you're speaking filth, there's filth in your gut. If you're speaking blasphemies, there's blasphemy in your stomach. If you are speaking wickedness and wrong and lies, then that is precisely what is in your heart. It's an easy tell. The tree is known by the fruit. Yes, amen. But we know what that fruit is by seeing what comes out of it when the pressure's on, when it's squeezed. Christ is very clearly indicating out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak is what comes out of the heart. In the form of words, that is what defiles you and reveals you as defiled. What comes out of a lemon when you squeeze it, whatever was on the inside. Continue on in verse 19. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. You see how they were straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel? Why aren't you washing your hands? And Jesus is like, why is your mouth and your heart full of evil thoughts? Why is your heart and your mouth spewing murders? Why can you not cease from adulteries and fornications? Is it because that's what's in your heart? And you're going to wrong and attack and benign these? For what? For not washing their hands? For not doing your religious ceremony that you've concocted of your own mind and your own mentality? Are you going to condemn the just because your heart is wicked? Are you going to condemn the righteous disciples that are walking with me because your own heart is full of blasphemy? I think so. And that's what he's revealing to these, these 
um, these, these Pharisees, and all they could do was be offended. They weren't going to get right. They weren't going to hear the word. They weren't going to hearken unto the scriptures. They're just going to get offended. And soon, they're going to seek to kill the Lord over it. Our words define us, our words defile us, and our words simply reveal what's already in our heart. Be mindful of this. People say, oh, watch your words, oh, watch your words. Watch what you're saying. I would say, guard your heart. Because all your words are is a manifestation of what's going on in there. Your heart is your mind, your will, your emotions, your core, your soul. Everything that you are that I can't reach out and touch right now. That's your heart. The core of your being. The Bible says of the word of God that it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing of soul and sunder is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of what? The heart. That's what the word of God does. It will discern your thoughts. It will discern the intents of your heart and it will reveal them in true light and expose them for what they actually are. That's what the Word of God does every time. That's a promise. The Bible says in Proverbs 23 and verse 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. In other words, the same thing about the lemon. As you think, as you discern, as you walk, as you believe in your heart, as you will in your heart, as you desire in your heart, everything that is you that I can't reach out and touch, what's going on there is simply a reflection of what you are. As if in his heart, so is he. People often get offended by the word of God. Why? Because the word of God doesn't, it, it isn't black and white. Or sorry, it isn't gray. It's black and white in most areas. Either you're right or you're wrong. And the word of God, when it enters into a man, or it is, it is, it is thrust at a man, or it is, is used upon a man, or it is heard by a man, brings offense because it reveals to them exactly what's in them. It discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. It divides. It cuts, is what the Word of God does. It reveals what's in them, and religious hypocrites especially hate it because they walk around with their mouth saying all sorts of religious vanities, with their heart honoring God, with their, with their heart uh, bringing honor to Him and drawing nigh unto Him with their lips, using vain, flattering words, long prayers in the marketplace, desiring to be seen of men, always trying to appear religious. But when the word of God hits them, it cuts them, exposes their heart, and they hate that. And we're, of course, susceptible to this. Be soft to the word of God. When it enters in, just be ready to bend to the will of the word of God. We should be a blank slate before the Bible. Of course, when men are preaching unto you, men are teaching unto you, use discernment, readily receive the word, and then figure out whether these things be so by reading it later, like the Bereans. But they had Christ before them, teaching them biblical truths after rebuking and exhorting them, and then later giving them clarity through the preaching. Hey, not what comes into you will defile you, but what comes out of you and all that comes out of you is doing is revealing what's in your heart i see your evil thoughts i i see your fornications i see your thefts why because that just came out of your mouth hearts full of lies and the tongue that speaketh lies so easily problem with religious people is that our opinion of self and our presentation of self becomes paramount. Okay, so, so if something's going to attack my opinion, and I think I'm Mr. Mr. High and Mighty, hoity-toity, religious zealot, if something attacks that, I'm instantly offended, and I respond with anger. My presentation of self, if something attacks how I look or how I appear in the public eye, someone steps on my long robe as I'm walking in the marketplace and seeking glory of men, I respond in anger. Why? Because whenever the scriptures contradicts what we think of ourselves or how we feel we're presenting ourselves, and it contradicts that, it attacks directly our pride. And that is the one thing that will keep people from getting saved. That is the one major and primary thing that will keep Christians from getting blessed. If you're saved and you're pride, ready for destruction. It's coming. 
Only by pride cometh contention. Let's keep that in mind too. If you're contentious with your brother, if you find yourself always in a battle with some other believer, only by pride cometh contention. There's pride in that scenario. Where two can't walk agreed, there is pride. Every time. And us religious folks, we're, we're guilty of it every time. <laughs> At least more susceptible. Matthew 23 now. The Word of God, all it's doing is revealing what's in us. All it's doing is exposing us as being hypocrites. All it's doing is bringing to light the things of darkness. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is going to start dealing with these scribes and Pharisees, reproving them. Matthew 23, in verse 25, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Right? So you got a lemon, and it's all rotten and disgusting and filthy on the inside. No good. But as long as that peel looks nice and yellow and bright and firm, you think you got something good. And what they do is they go and they polish that thing, make it look really nice. But again, what happens when it's squeezed? Oh, rot, mold, filth comes out. He's saying the same about the cup and of the platter. They're going to go and they're going to take some filthy, disgusting cup and they're going to wash the outside really good. They're going to make it sparkle, make it shine. In our lives, we'll go and we'll put on the suit, right? We'll go and we'll walk the walk and we'll talk the talk. We'll make, we'll, we'll vainly feign that we are something that we are not, but if we don't deal with the heart, the end result is always going to be embarrassment and shame when what's in our heart is exposed. Christ is going to teach them here, verse 26, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of the cup may be clean also. You know what Christ is saying? Deal with your heart first before you try to become some sort of religious image, before you try to follow some religious pattern, before you try to make everything look good on the outside, deal with the inside. Deal with the heart. Why? Because everything that's on the outside is just going to manifest what's in your heart, especially in including your words. People will get saved, let's say, and they go home and they still drink and, and party and gamble and do all the things that they always did maybe before they were saved. But when they come to church, they put on a nice suit, they, they change their language, they change their appearance. But that same person, the lemon, right? What happens when someone stomps on his toe? blickety blank just comes out of them right because that's what was in their heart and we're awful for this we want to we want to make clean the outside when the inside of us is full of extortion and excess we want to make everything look good on the outside to those that are around us make it look like we got it all together we don't deal with the inside and therefore we are just one decision away from exposing the truth of who we are Verse 27 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So what happens to these Pharisees? What happens to these religious zealots when they go and they try to show themselves in the marketplace as being clean and clear and righteous in the sight of men? What happens to these when something comes upon them that was unexpected? When pressure is put on them? When there's, a, when there's a hard time that comes upon them? When there's a squeeze put upon them? Hypocrisy and iniquity will just come flowing out of them. And this is what happens to the carnal Christian who's never been changed by the word of God, but only seeks to conform themselves with what the religious world around them shows them is right. It's what happens to them every time. And this is why in our circle of friends, this is why in worlds beyond, this is why if you've ever been around church in your life, for more than a few years, you will find people that show up, walk the walk, talk the talk, look good, sound good, act good, and then they're gone tomorrow. And then you find them drinking, you find them, you know, partying, you find them whatever, just out of church. You find them 
you know, doing all sorts of things that the world does. It's because they never had that change in their heart. They never had God do that work in them, but they were always just showing this vain hypocrisy and this vain um, outward showing. They cleaned the outside of the cup, but they didn't take care of the heart. They were a whited sepulcher, so they made it look all good, but inside there was nothing but dead men's bones. Go to 1 Peter, if you would. So what our God does, because he doesn't want a bunch of hypocrites in the church, he doesn't want us to walk around as a bunch of hypocrites. He doesn't want Pharisees to make up his kingdom here upon earth. What God does is he sends the pressure. As you're turning to 1 Peter chapter 1, let me read for you Deuteronomy 8, 2. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee. So God's here doing the leading. It says, These forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no, God indicating, Deuteronomy 8, verse 2, that he led them in the path that he did. He sent the trials before them. He brought them on this 40-year journey, and you can read about it in the previous chapters, to the end that he could humble them, to the end that he could prove them and know their heart, whether they would follow him, obey him, or not. And this is what God does. God takes us Christians as lemons and gives us a little squeeze. So he can know what's in our hearts and whether we will serve him or no. These trials are then good for us because we don't want to be in the and no category. We want to be in the category that obeys his commandments, not the and no. <laughs> Just very simply, will you obey my commandments or no? Nobody wants to be that or no. No Christian wants to be that or no category when it comes to God. Rejecting him, denying him, not serving him. So God sends us his word. He sends us trials. And he does so along life's journey to determine who we are and to reveal to ourselves who we are. He wants to know, we need to know what's truly in our hearts. So the, the, the soft heart will get it right, will repent and change. But the hardened heart will continue on that path of hypocrisy and ruin, ultimately. These trials then should drive us to dependence because it's the word of God revealing things to me. It's also the word of God that's going to clean things in me. We ought to be dependent of God. 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 3. 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Great verse to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. What a great promise. We are kept by the power of God unto salvation. We gave him our faith, and that's it. And in the last time, that will be revealed. What will be revealed? Our incorruptible inheritance, our undefiled, fadeth not away promise and inheritance. We have a lively hope. It's a living hope. It's a promise, and it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Continuing in verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, we've been through those seasons of just rejoicing, celebrating, being happy, you know, when that lively hope first came, when we were begotten again unto that lively hope, God here says, and maybe Peter was writing to new Christians, he says, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. If need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at appearing of Jesus Christ. So here, that faith is purified by the trial that's set before you. 
And so when God brings a challenge in your life, when God takes you as a lemon and puts a little squeeze on you, he's only doing so that what's in you would be improved. This trial is much more precious than gold. That perishes. This is an eternal trial. This is something that is beyond this world when God puts you through heaviness, when God puts you through manifold, te uh, manifold temptations. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. And Christians, when God puts the squeeze on you, when he puts pressure on you, if you faint, if you just let it go, if you just release what was inside of you, thy strength was small. That's clear. That's revealed. We need tough skin. We need thick skin to be Christians in this world. Right? And so when the pressure comes on us, it's only to build stronger skin around us. It's that work hardening that I talked about a few weeks back. God puts us through something, but never so much that it should break us. But the problem is, is with us sometimes, if we've just accumulated in our hearts rottenness, don't be surprised if God pushes you just a little far so that gets exposed. If your heart is full of wickedness, don't be surprised if God pushes you just a little bit too far and that gets exposed. 2 Peter then, 1 and verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. <clears throat> and so how do we keep a clean heart and not expose a rotten heart <laughs> when the pressure is on? Because this is always going to be the rub. Like I said, some of us are really good at religiously putting on an appearance but when we go home, within the thoughts and tents of our hearts, when we're alone, when we're not around our Christian brothers and sisters, we act completely different. Some of us are really good at putting on a show. No different than the Pharisees. But what happens is when the pressure is put on, what happens when you put the squeeze on an hypocritical Christian? What comes out? Hypocrisy. What happens when you squeeze that lemon? Whatever's on the inside comes to the surface. And so in our flesh, if that's how we're growing in the Christian life, by behaving the way we think we ought to, instead of letting God actually move in us and work in us and change us inwardly, when we just try to act a certain way, all we're doing is just suppressing the inevitable. That thing will pop. When the pressure's on, you will see what was on the inside. And that's what we've experienced. That's what's going on in the world. That's why you look around and people are, are, are masked with you know, plastic shields on. Because her heart was full of fear, anxiety, depression, whatever, so that as soon as the pressure was put on her, it manifested exactly what was in her heart. And we're seeing that time and time again. Look at the believers that six months ago, seven months, I mean, it's been so long since pre-COVID, right? Seven, eight months ago, look at the believers that you thought were rock steady, hard, never going to budge, never going to move, never going to change, always going to be fighting the good fight of faith. And then next thing you know, you find them obey the government, do what you're supposed to do, six feet apart. I mean, I just listened to a preacher make a public service announcement that sounded like it was, it was penned out by the Antichrist himself. He's literally just like, like, we've done everything we can. Like, we, we've, we've taken it to the governor, and he thinks we're, we're conforming. We can now open our church because he said so. They're bowing down. And all that's happened is the pressure was put on them, and they're just revealing what they are. They're just revealing themselves as, as subservient to a government and not God. They're just revealing themselves as being afraid and not fearless in, in, in Christ. They're, they're revealing what's in their hearts. And these are the perfect times. And I said this early on in, in my preaching, I think week one or week two, I said we need to mark the mouths of people as they talk now. People are saying, close the church. People are saying, obey your government. People are saying, it's just for a little time. It's just for a season. And so we will obey whatever the government says at this time. Mark what's in their mouth because they're telling you that that's what's in their heart. Complete subservience to not the highest power, but just a higher power. And they may not be doing it just because they want to bow down and worship God, but maybe their problem is just fear. You saw what's in their hearts. You can mark people that when there's trials, tribulations, struggles, it's the best time to know what's in the heart of a man. 
because they'll tell it to you. They'll give it away. You squeeze a lemon, you get what's ever on the inside. Every time. So how do we then keep a clean heart when the pressure's on? Second Peter 1 and verse 19, it says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. You believe that today? Above all the visions, above all the preaching, above all that you have heard in some documentary, above all that you have read in some article, about any miracle or experience that has gone in your life, and Peter saw a great one, right? The transfiguration of Christ. And he says, I've got something more sure than even that that I saw with my own eyes. God the Father crying from heaven, this is my beloved Son, and who am I am well pleased. He says, I have something more sure. I'm more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. What is that saying? You've got the Bible. You've got the surest word of prophecy. I heard it today. It's not the final, all the final authority in our lives. It ought not be the final authority of our lives. It ought to be the soul authority of our lives. You know what final authority? We say it all the time. I might, I might even have it written in our statement of faith. I don't know. As the final authority. Do you know what that means? That means I appealed to different authorities along the way. And then finally, when there was nothing else, I went to the Word of God. Now we ought to think of this as the sole authority of all matters of faith and practice. The sole authority in our lives. It's more sure than anything else. This Word, and he says, Ye do well to take heed, as unto a light that shineth in darkness. If your heart is full of darkness, you need that light to shine in it. Until how long? Until the day dawn and the day star rise in your heart. Until the end of days. Until you finally see Christ. You ought to take heed to this sure word of prophecy as the only authority in your life. That's how you make sure your heart is clean and pure. And when the pressure's on, what'll come out of it? When you squeeze somebody that has the Word of God in their hearts, the Word of God's going to come out. Next, let peace of God rule. Go to Colossians, to the left. Colossians chapter 3. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians is for, before the TH books. <clears throat> First, let the light shine in darkness. That's how you keep a clean heart. Let peace rule in your heart. Colossians 3, look at verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. You need to have thankfulness in your heart. And then what happens? If you're full of thankfulness and God squeezes you, what's going to come out? More thankfulness. Can you imagine when you're going through the biggest trial in your life, the most suffering, the greatest temptation, and God squeezes your heart, and you've been having the word of Christ dwelling in you? It's brought a peace which passeth all understanding. You've been singing to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There's grace in your heart to the Lord, and God says, I'm going to send this brother through a trial. And what comes out? More psalms. What comes out? More rejoicing. What comes out? More thankfulness to God for all he's done. More admonishing to your brothers and sisters. How often have you even seen that recently? Go on Facebook for like five minutes and nobody's admonishing one another to stay in the fight. No one's encouraging one another to keep into the battle and to keep your hearts at peace and to let the word of God dwell in you. And so we have a bunch of Christians that are just beating up on each other, malicious to each other, fighting one another. And if you are exhibiting that from your mouth, and yes, this is also your heart speaking. And this is also your heart speaking. If that's what's coming out of you is hatefulness towards your brother, that's what's in your heart. How can you love God and hate your brother? The Bible says you're a liar. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And if it is, when the pressure's put on and that's all that's in your heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. When God squeezes that, 
When he puts the pressure on you, that's what's going to come out. Peace, rejoicing, thankfulness towards God and that all that he has done. And you know what? When somebody's in the worst scenario, hey, think of the Apostle Paul in prison. What came out of his mouth when the squeeze was on him? He was locked up, chained up in the second prison behind a bunch of different quatrains of soldiers, whosoever was there. He was singing and making melody in his heart to the Lord because that's what was in his heart. So you squeeze them and that's what comes out. Amen? Let the light shine in. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Next, you got a war in the spirit. Turn to the left, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> you need to war in the spirit because this is the problem. We like to war in the flesh. The truth is we walk in the flesh and that's, that's fine. That's good. That's the reality for all of us. Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He wanted freedom from his flesh. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3 says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And if you're fighting your spiritual battles in the flesh, you got big problems coming. You're going to fall. Why? Because you're just going to be full of flesh. And when we squeeze that spiritual truth, when we squeeze you spiritually, flesh is going to come out. And, and nobody wants flesh to come out. You don't want to see my flesh all over this room. It's not a good thing. Flesh warreth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary. The things that you like about Brother Josh is because Christ put it there. It's not because of my flesh. <laughs> There's no righteousness in my flesh. Who shall deliver me from that body? I thank God. 2 Corinthians 10, he says, For the weapons of our warfare, in verse 4, are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Look at this. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Remember the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so when imaginations come in, like what about this? I'm the greatest Christian ever. I, you know, I am presenting myself an excellent servant to you guys, you know. Today is the day of salvation. When I say stuff like that about myself, some high thought that I'm greater than everybody, that imagination needs to be cast down. And you know what? We can, we can be susceptible to that, for sure. Cast down imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. We need to war in the Spirit. Bottom line of all of this is that we need to have Christ in you. Like I said, we all know people, and we all have done it, and we all have seen it. People that walk the walk, talk the talk religiously, and then pressure gets put on them, and they quit. And they're back to their old ways. That's somebody that has warred in the flesh, and never warred in the spirit. Our weapons of warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. If I've quit smoking in my own flesh, if I've quit drinking in my own flesh, if I've quit doing X, Y, and Z because I've overcome it in my flesh, just wait till the squeeze gets put on. I will be right back to smoking, drinking, and doing all of those things because I did not overcome them because God put some sort of spiritual strength in me, but rather I've overcome them because I've mustered up enough courage of my own flesh. The flesh shall profit you nothing in all avenues of your life. Let the light in. Let the peace rule in you. War in the spirit. Bottom line, have Christ in you. He is the hope of glory. If you want to glory, if you want to overcome, if you want to be strong in this Christian life, if you want to fight unto the end, Romans chapter 8, you need to have Christ in you, the hope of glory. Romans chapter 8, and in verse 6 it says, For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans 8 and verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, or it's the enemy of God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And if you are warring in the flesh, you're not pleasing God. If you are soul winning in the flesh, you're not pleasing God. If you're preaching the Bible in the flesh, you're not pleasing God. And people do this all the time. We've seen scores of them. People that of their own flesh 
muster up spiritual zeal. And if you are doing that, you've not pleased God. You get a hundred souls saved while you're walking in your flesh. You've not pleased God. You won't see an ounce of reward for that. You cannot please God by behaving and acting and overcoming, let's say, in the flesh. This fruit that is in you will always reveal itself by what comes out when the pressure is on you. And every time, every time we've seen one of these Christians who acts and walks and talks and lives in the power of their own flesh, when the pressure's on, they expose themselves as being false brethren. They expose themselves as being as carnal as all get out. They expose themselves for who they are. They ought to first clean the inside of the cup that the outside may be clean also. Romans 8 and verse 10 says, And if Christ be in you. Remember when you squeeze a lamb, you get what's ever on the inside? What happens when you squeeze a Christian? If Christ be in you. And that's a choice you have to make. You have to walk in the Spirit to have Christ dwelling in you. You have to reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 13, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. If you want to live, if you want to get through the battle, if you want to finish strong, you need to have Christ in you. And that is a moment by moment, a day by day decision. And it also is something that you build up to. You grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. You, you, you have sub one p point of submission at a time, one command obeyed at a time. You will grow in Christ and he will dwell in you richly. Of course, the spirit lives in you, but that spirit that lives in us lusteth to envy and sometimes we just push him to the side sometimes honestly we just we just suppress the spirit as much as we can because we're fully carnal but if christ is in you the hope of glory then when the next round of covid shutdowns comes when the next time somebody screams at you at a door or tells you to put on a face mask or, or attacks you for something you didn't, a lies about you. When, when that happens, when the squeeze, the, the pressure is put on you, when somebody hurts you, wrongs you, lies about you, when your finances start crumbling, when you start having issues in your life, when the squeeze is put on you, if Christ is in you, the only thing that's going to come out is Christ. And that's what we need to strive for. We need to suppress, mortify, kill, destroy the flesh. We don't want that thing bubbling up. Whatever is on the inside of the fruit, that's the heart. And that will eventually spill out. Make sure that it's Christ. Make sure your heart is full of Christ. You're dwelling in Christ and He in you. It's that reciprocating abiding. He lives in you, you live in Him. That's what you need all the time, moment by moment. How do you get that? Let the light in. How do you get that? Let the peace of God rule in your heart, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Let the rule of the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Be full of that and war in the spirit. Don't war, fight in the flesh. No, you'll be destroyed. You won't please God if you're doing any of this Christian walk in the flesh. Serve him in the spirit, in the newness of the spirit, and have Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then, when the pressure's on, all will be able to see is Christ. And you won't end up being marked one of those COVID crazies because you couldn't keep it together. Right? You, you lost your mind. You flipped out. You were angry with people. You are yelling at people. You are you're just exhibiting nothing but flesh. At a time when God was just pressuring you so that he could make something great about you, you missed the chance. You missed the mark. Hey, repent of that. If you messed up, if you got mad at people, if you got stressed out during COVID and, and you felt like it just ruined your Christian life, hey, we can recover from that. That's fine. Repent. Get it right. Move on from now. Wait for the next challenge when Christ will put the squeeze on you to the end that you will be tried to come out whiter as a result, polished as a Christian. I thank you, God, for your word. I, I thank you, Lord.